Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Rockman Power Hour. Uh, my name is Jason Rockman, and thank you for being with us today. I uh, want to bring on my co-host, Ryan Stick, right out of the gate. Ryan, what do you got on today? Oh, 13 Ooh. ghosts. Yes, I do. I'm I've been that. rocking my studio house designs wear, and I got to say, uh, you know, I've worn this shirt so much that I'm almost, I smell almost as scary as that movie oh is. Oh, my God. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I got my Dario Argento Profondo Rosso, which is uh, deep red. One of the uh, uh, Jello movies from uh, from Art D Dario Argento. So check out Studio House Designs. They are the ones that keep us looking fresh all the time. And uh, we also want to thank our title sponsor, uh, Heartbeat Hot Sauce. The podcast is presented by them. Uh, I have today the uh, wonderful Red Habanero, which um, I cracked open the other day. I put some of these on my eggs, and man. Ryan, my whole breakfast experience changed with this. Um, this is great stuff. Small company out of Thunder Bay that we love working with um, that are great, awesome. So go check them out at heartbeathotsauce.com. Um, Canadian product, awesome hot sauce, the best hot sauce in the world as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. And uh, they've got a bunch of varieties and uh, really, really happy to have them on board. And I, I, no joke, I love this stuff. And I know you do as well. Um, absolutely. I'm very <laughs> thankful. I'm the type of guy that puts a hot sauce on everything. Yeah. So the fact same. that we have different hot sauces for different things really brings the whole thing home. Cause if they just gave us this one giant bottle and it's just like, hope it works out. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, ex yeah. exactly. There's something for every kind of meal or dish that you're going to have, uh, you know, some stuff will merit something really spicy. And then there's the dill pickle hot sauce, which have you tried the dill pickle one yet? I have actually, and I, and I really like it. And dill pickle is usually not my jam, yeah. but I really like it, this one. It's yeah. really, really good. And you know, like not to throw any other hot sauces under the bus, but you know, you'll get a bottle of like Sriracha and like you're saying, it's like that one thing and it's good, mm -hmm. but then you go to something like this and it's just like a whole other ball game. So check them out heartbeat hot sauce. Um, great company. We're happy to have them on board for the podcast and um, they're just really nice people make it a killer product. Um, speaking of a killer product, Ryan, our guest mm. today. Uh, they don't get much more killer as humans than this guy. Uh, we had a bit of dealings with him, you and I, um, over the last year because he was part of our Kings of Quarantine project. And um, he's the bass player and arguably one of the most popular metal bands in the world right now, Five Finger Death Punch. Uh, Chris Kale is our guest today on the Rockman Power Hour. Now, Ryan, um, this guy is, uh, this, I mean, the, the conversation with him and I was really fun. We have a lot in yep. common. Um, we're both sober guys, um, but he's just got this this work ethic and this integrity that just is infectious. Yeah, and a confidence too. I mean, yeah. he, he was even mentioning in his when he was. You'll hear in the interview, ladies and gentlemen, that even when he was a kid, like you know, it was remarked in his report card. Uh, is grading groups shows natural leadership, and I'm yeah. and I and I can kind of see that, and I feel a lot of power that he has within his beard. It's like a superpower. And every <laughs> yeah. time I see it, it grows bigger. And, and now it looks like a Cthulhu monster or something. It's just insane. Yeah. He's definitely known for his, uh, for his awesome beard and, uh, and for his great stage presence and great bass playing. And, and, you know, like, like I mentioned, five finger are uh, arguably one of the biggest metal bands on the planet. And, um, and we touched on a lot of things in the interview. We touched on how he got into the band, which is a crazy story because this guy was a successful bartender in Las Vegas and actually moonlit as the bass player for five figure death punch while he was still bartending until he got enough confidence to say, okay, this is going to be a main gig. And I, and I love that. That shows, that shows the real human condition. Cause you know, you talk to some people like, yeah, man, the band was everything. It's like, no, if you're any kind of a, um, uh, you know, a person that has any experience with musicians and you know, the struggle, there's yeah. no falling into music and it being a full-time gig right away. It usually is several, several steps to get there. And the fact that he was so candid about that, um, speaks volumes of his character. Yeah, especially so people who don't abandon their jobs immediately when they think they're just, you know, they have delusions yeah. of grandeur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I thought I was going to be a rock star when I was a teenager, and I'm just like, I don't have to do anything else. Fuck you, math. Yeah. Rock star time. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, some of us learn those lessons harder than others. And, uh, mm. I, listen, I, I, I know, man, I, I was in a band, I toured. Um, I got to a point where I was paying my rent, and that was, uh, a dream come true, but that was only sustain sustainable for a certain amount of time. And then, you know, you're like, you got to be working. You got to be a touring musician. You got to be, you got to be out there. You got to be selling merch. So it was interesting to see how he flipped the pandemic. 
and brought it into um, a, a positive for him and uh, and found ways to not only grow himself, but to help other people have a good time and, and, and have great experiences. So yeah, it, 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 I, I love this chat. So, um, but I don't want to go on too much. I want to get right to this because it is a fairly lengthy chat and a really interesting one. So if you're a fan of Five Finger Death Punch, I think you're going to really like this. If you're a fan of awesome people, and if you're a fan of someone who uh, is candid about how they've overcome some of their uh, demons and and gone on to to really, really uh, work on those things, um, you're going to like this conversation with our guest this week, Chris Kale. All right. Uh, really, really happy to have today on the podcast uh, a guy who I've never formally met in person, but I've been friends with for a while now. Um, he's come to my aid a couple of times when I've asked him to do some stuff, and uh, he just seems like an all-around good, good, good dude. So I'm happy to welcome Chris Kale to the podcast. Um, how are you, man? I'm good, man. Waking up. Uh, woke up about an hour ago and uh, just checking out all those plaques you got on the wall back there. And fun codes and all kinds of stuff. I know one fun code that you're missing, though. Yeah, well, I was, we're, we're going to talk about that because you guys have your own Funko and, and, and um, that, you know, what I, what I love about this band is that um, you guys don't shy away from doing rad stuff. And, and it always seems like there's some kind of a rad collaboration that's going on with Five Finger Death Punch, whether it be, uh, you know, whether it be a food thing, whether it be Ivan with his, um, you know, with his, uh, his, his line of edibles and, 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 and that kind of stuff, whether it be a Funko, uh, whether it be you partnering with, with vets, I mean, it seems like you guys are always, you have your tentacles in a lot of different things. We are, and we are well aware of the platform that we have yeah. and you know, you can only do so much with music, but uh, that, that platform allows us to, to reach out to even more people. Like you mentioned working with the vets and whatnot. Um, we have uh, an easy job. I, I essentially get up on stage and beard bang for the sake of rock and roll. But yeah. because the audience that we have out there, we're able to kind of get involved in a bunch of different charities. Um, a couple of us are sober in the band, so we try to do as much as we can for the sober community. Yeah. Um, veterans, police department, um, you know, just a, a lot of different um, that groups that have had their backs turned on them at, at many times. And yeah. uh, we, our platform is big. We, uh, we have what we fight for and, and what they fight for. And luckily, those uh, things kind of mesh. Two things, yeah. It ideally works out pretty well. And I think uh, it's it's a common theme in metal and with a lot of metal fans and and metal musicians. You know, where a lot of us are people that just never really fit in. So to find a place where we fit in and to find a community that we, you know, in the metal community, I, it doesn't surprise me that a lot of people that might feel that way in their other areas of their life will gravitate towards metal, and Definitely. and and metal in turn will gravitate towards people that you know might need someone to kind of have their back. Exactly. I always hear from fans uh, from time to time. They're like. Uh... Yeah, you know, I want to go to the show, but I can't get any of my friends to go. That happens from time to time. And I'm like, you know what? Like, go to the show. There's going to be people just like you all around you. That's yeah. a family. Buy that ticket. Come hang out. You're not going to regret it. It's kind of the same thing. I'm, I'm really involved with Comic-Cons. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's the same thing in the Comic-Con community. Like, when I was growing up, if you told people you read comics, you were a nerd and you were a loser. <laughs> you know, now the nerds have taken over. And if you, if you have anything to do with comic books, and if you're one of those kids that was smart enough to keep your, you know, your amazing fantasy 15, your, your X-Men number one, you're a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I was just talking to somebody about that the other day. Uh, my buddy Ron's got a kid. Actually, I don't know if I should say his name in case his kid's listening right now. She knows. <laughs> she knows. He's like, oh man, my kid is such a nerd, but you know what? Like nerds run the world. I'm like, you're exactly right. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> it, it, it really has become that way. And, and that's a good thing. I mean, I think, I think, it, you know, we, it, I, when I was younger, I remember, you know, revenge of the nerds and stuff like that. And the, and the term nerd and geek has kind of, it's kind of morphed. It's kind of flipped itself. Very true. Um, if anything, you're more of a nerd and a geek. If you're not into that stuff, I think there's something wrong with you. If you're not into that nerdy stuff. Oh yeah. It's all the stuff that people considered nerdy back in the day. Yeah. Uh, video games, um, cartoons, computers, that sort of thing. That's what we're all on uh, these days. So yeah, in essence, aren't we all really nerds these days? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um, so you've been in the band for a uh, little over a decade. Um, you've, uh, you know, the band has catapulted. I mean, there's no, there's no denying it. You guys are one of the biggest bands in metal. Um, is it, is it something that you that you kind of have a hard time with ever in terms of like just grasping the fact that you guys have that effect and, and you guys have that influence? You know, I've always kind of been like the guy that's been on stage. I'm always right. very, very big personality. Uh, even back in like 
uh, first grade, I remember on my report card, it said something like Chris is a great leader, natural born leader. Uh, people gravitate towards him. So I've always been comfortable in groups, um, right. whether it be like within a band, whether it be, you know, whatever sort of collective and also in big crowds too. Yeah. This though, this is a monster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know that when I joined, I joined at the end of the writing cycle for American capitalist. Right. So yeah, it's been, it'll be 11 years in May. Yeah. So uh, I thought I was ready to step into that. Woo! That's a, that's a whole new beast. I don't know that uh, anybody could step from behind the bar, which is where I was as a bartender in Las Vegas into like this, this huge beast is that's five finger death punch. But yeah, essentially to me, people always ask, you know, what's it like being in this band? To me, it feels like every other band that I've been in, in my life. Yeah. You know, the, the nucleus, this um, right in the middle, it's just us. We're all hanging out, all that stuff, but it's like being in the eye of a hurricane with this thing because we're here and there's so much stuff going on around us. So yeah. many people listening and, and, and uh, actively involved. We're luckily uh, a band that most of our fans, it's not just like, oh yeah, you know, I like Death Lunch. No. No, they're, they're, you got, they're yeah, they're, 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 well, that, yeah, so you got your, favorite. your fans are very, they're passionate, you know, it's almost like, you know, like juggalos, like juggalos are passionate about ICP and you guys have that kind of a fan base that are, they're, they're involved. It's not just, you know, not a casual listen. Even dating back to like the Kiss Army. I'm a huge, right. huge Kiss fan. Yeah. And you know what we were kind of, I don't know, I'm getting ready to say something that's going to get <laughs> uh, clickbaited. Uh, we are a band that we have five individual personalities, much like Kiss. They had four individual personalities, but they came together to form Kiss. We came together to form Five Finger Death Punch. And with those five individual personalities, we're all very different. So fans can kind of gravitate towards one or the other while still liking the entire band. So right, right. Uh, kind of like you know, a superhero vibe, yeah. I guess, you know, the power of whatever this is hanging <laughs> off my chin. <laughs> so you had mentioned to me that you were um, behind the bar. Mm -hmm one day and then playing on stage the next. Um, was it really that quick? I mean, was it the oh, kind of thing? It was even quicker than that. Really? Uh, so tell me, tell me about it. Tell me about it, how the hell all that came together. The audition process. I got, I got the gig via text um, after audition. And um, I was working at the Cosmopolitan at the pool. Yeah. And I got the text and I'd been close before. Like I auditioned for a band called Systematic years ago. Um, thought I almost had that. Johnny Chow ended up getting it. And so I've been real close before. So when I got that text, I was like, I'm not telling nobody. I don't want anybody to know because in case this thing falls apart, I'm not going to be the guy. Oh, he's the one that uh, was almost played in five things. Oh, yeah. So I, uh, I had the gig at the Cosmopolitan and I loved it. Great money. Um, good vibes. I was, I was set for, you know, the life of a bartender, union bartender. It was just, it was good. I took a pay cut the first three years. I was in death punch from going from bartending in Vegas to the new guy in death punch. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, it's changed now, so I can't yeah. complain. But <laughs> um, yeah, so when I first got the text, it was a brand new property. Cosmopolitan had it opened up uh, January, and this was May of 2010 when I got the gig behind the bar via text. And I went up to management upstairs, and I was like, hey, uh, I know we're a brand new property, and you're not supposed to ask off, but I'm going to need off weekends. The band was going to be doing weekend gigs, festivals, radio festivals, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then come home through the week. So I was like, I like this job. I'm making good money. I'm going to do both. So I went up to management, told them, Hey, I'm going to need weekends off. <laughs> and I just remember there was a, a manager named M. She was in one of the rolling chairs. I just see her go, what? You need off weekends. <laughs> <laughs> in Vegas. <laughs> she rolled back. Exactly. For a brand new property. When the, when the summer first comes up. So uh, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I got another gig. Um, and they're like, what's the gig? And I didn't really want to tell them because I didn't want it to be, I don't want everybody to be like, oh, you know, hey, go talk to that guy. He's in Death Punch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, um, I got a gig that I'm going to be working with those guys on the weekend, but I'll be able to have my days open through the week so I can still work. And they're like, what's this new gig? <sighs> it's a band. I, I got a musical opportunity. What's the band? <laughs> Five Finger Death Punch. M, the girl who had just rolled out, rolled out again and goes, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, I got you. Oh my God. He can get off any weekends he wants. <laughs> wow. So they were supportive. Very much so. Yeah. And That's I didn't really incredible. tell too many people. I, I told uh, like a handful of maybe three or four people. It was crazy because I would go uh, fly out to go play with Death Punch on the weekends. 
one of our first shows. Actually, our very first show was um, up in Canada. It's not okay. coming to me right now what the name of the gig was. But uh, come up there, play the gig, and then uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I'd work behind the bar at the Cosmopolitan. So going wow. from you know, 15,000 people at uh, a radio festival going to, hey, would you like another mojito? But, but, and talk about humility, right? It- Very much so, yeah. And like I said, I was just playing it smart, you know? Uh, I knew it was going to be a feeling out process. What if I didn't like them? What if they didn't like me? I ain't losing this job. So uh, my dad always uh, said to have a backup plan. That was my backup plan, the Cosmopolitan, just in case. <laughs> other than that, no other backup plans. <laughs> how long after until how long into the band did you finally say, okay, I, I'm going to let the, the bartending gig go? I had two separate stints. So in the beginning, I worked that first summer as um, a bartender behind the bar at the Cosmopolitan. And then we got to our first long tour that I was on was us and Hate Breed um, Share the Welt Tour. So that started in October. Yep. And I was going to be gone for like eight weeks. So I couldn't work anymore at that point. So that's when I finally gave my notice. But then uh, <laughs> uh, about, what was it? The next re- album cycle was The Wrong Side of Heaven, which was a double album. So we're at home in Vegas working on that record. I play the bass. So I'm the last thing to get added on to uh, the recording. You don't want the bass on top of the guitars. We're a very guitar-driven band. So sure. they get in there doing that. And then the bass parts go on. So I'm just sitting around incredibly bored. It's just like, oh. So I called my old manager at the Hard Rock where I used to work and I said, hey, Greg, hypothetically, if I wanted to come back behind the bar and work upstairs, there's like a concert venue and bit, um, banquets up there. I was like, hypothetically, if I wanted to come back, would you have room for me up there? He goes, absolutely. So I went to back to the bar for I think I worked three, three gigs at that point. Okay. <laughs> uh, the first two, one was like a rave or like a DJ show or something. Another one was a banquet. And then. Uh, I worked Drowning Pool at the Hard Rock Cafe, and uh, it was my first time working a metal show. And I'm behind the bar, talked to uh, talked to the guys from um, Drowning Pool for a little bit. Came back, started working. Fans started coming in. I then you'd start to see it doing this. <laughs> and then they uh, then one person came up. Photos started coming. Photos started coming. Oh my God, what are you doing working here? I'm yeah. bored. <laughs> I need to back. Need to get back on the road. <laughs> right. So uh, I remember my my work wife Naomi. Uh, it's a girl I work behind the bar with all the time. We always have the same shifts. Very power uh, power duo behind the bar. Uh, I remember her going, "Kale, if you're not going to work, get the fuck off my tip clock." And I'm like, "I'm over here creating guest experiences. These people are never <laughs> going to be able to experience this ever again." <laughs> But I got I got off of her tip clock and just hung out and watched the uh, drowning pool that night. <laughs> That's funny. So so then you obviously at one point just said, okay, it's it's full time band, right? That's when I went into like the, all the my hustle. I've always been um, a strong. Um, I've always had a strong hustle ever since I was a little kid. Yeah, uh, I, like the snow would fall. I'd be the first one out with my shovel. Hey, you need anybody to uh, do your driveway here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. not doing that. My first base I bought with. Uh, money made doing like lawn care and mowing grass and all that stuff. So I've always been the hustler. So, you know, just trying to create new revenue streams. Uh, even now today, you know, I'm doing cameos. Um, I, saw the, I saw the base packages that I have on stage. You can buy the, the BC Rich Warlock that I play on stage. And then I hand it to the fan at the end, meet them, take some pictures and whatnot. So always oh, nice. trying to trying to find out new ways to have guest experiences and guest experiences. Listen to me, the bartender came out <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to find new ways of uh, enhancing the fan experience stuff that I would want to do. Sure. Um, you know, even with the bass, like I could hypothetically sell one bass for every song and people would buy it, but I want to make it special for the fan. Sure. Not so, trying to, so at like, the end of the, yeah. So they really feel like, Hey, you know, this was the show. He played this bass at the whole show. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I do two bases for each show because I have two different tunings. Okay. Um, so one tuning is one base. The other tuning is the other base. People have the opportunity to get that over at chriscale.com. And then I meet them, sign the base, but that was the thing. You know, I didn't want it to be just a money grab. I wanted it to be an, an experience. Yeah. Uh, I've, like I said, I've always been a people person ever since that report card in first grade. And uh, I, I like the interactions with fans, um, you know, between we're, we're one of the first bands that really had uh, social media um, blew up with social media, you know, yep. before us, 
we were on that cusp of, of bands that were taken off right when uh, it was in MySpace back then, MySpace, Facebook, Instagram, yep. all that stuff. So, you know, we're able to, to really have um, a, a much more close connection than, you know, the mystique that other bands had you know, before social media. So, uh, th- and that's been part of um, what has made the fans uh, connect with us so much and be so passionate and so supportive is that, you know, we have a genuine real connection uh, through the power of, of social networking and whatnot. So it works well for me because I'm, I'm that, I've always been that guy, social media whore. Yeah, but, but you're also a people guy. I mean, I think you just enjoy, like, you know, you just enjoy people. And, um, and I think, you know, if you're in this kind of a profession um, and you don't like people, if popularity ensues, you've got an issue. Ooh, oh yeah. You're going to have a lot of problems with it. And and you see it with certain people. They just don't, you know, they want to be artists, but they don't want to have the, and, and it does. And, and I, and I love the analogy of you saying there's five individuals because I'm sure out of the five people in the band, not everybody is much of a people person as you are. Maybe some of the guys are a little more introverted and, and a little quieter. And, and mm-hmm. cause, but I, but I think it's important that, um, that, you know, that people that do have a platform and can give those people those, you know, once in a lifetime experiences, those money can't buy experiences, um, that they do it because it's, it, it, to me, it's, you know, any, any kind of popularity um, that anybody has and, and if they use it, you know, in a respectful way, there's just so much you can get back from that just as a human. Oh yeah. And we get, we get back from it as well. Um, yeah. When the yeah. pandemic started in 2020 and everybody was in quarantine, um, we ended up, uh, we postponed some shows that April. I think we were then doing some shows in November, had to cancel those. And at that point, I was like, all right, I've had enough of this. Like, it's time to tr- turn this thing around. So uh, when we canceled the shows, I had woke up to uh, three requests for refunds on those base packages. Right. I didn't know we were canceling the tour until I got refund requests. And it's like, oh, all right, all right. That was, I think it was on a Monday, maybe a Tuesday when I got that message. So I put, up, put it out online. I said, hey, the bases that are available, you're going to want to grab them because a big announcement is coming on Friday. So Friday, I announced that uh, I was getting on planes, flying the bases out directly to people's houses. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, not only did I, I, did, I think I sold 14 bases at that point. Um, I didn't want to have to give back, what, 28 grand in refunds at right. that point. I was like, that's a big hit. I, I can't afford to take it. With I don't know when the hell we're going to work again. Yeah. So uh, I ended up um, selling, I think, another 17 on top of that. Okay. And literally just getting on the plane, my assistant Liad was doing all the booking and whatnot, uh, put me on flights, got me rental cars, and I was going directly to people's houses wow. on that base. So yeah, again, the, the fan experience. Yeah, that's amazing. I don't know anybody else that, that would no. do that. And, and I got back from it too. I'd just gone through a breakup. I wasn't playing um, music at that point. I mean, we were, we were still Five Finger Death Punch, but in all intents and purposes, it was non-existent. So I was no longer you know, Chris from Death Punch. I didn't have that attachment uh, to that anymore. And, uh, I was <laughs> so many fans were like, Oh, thank you so much for like doing this for us. And, you know, it gave us something to look forward to. And I was like, uh, I needed this mentally as well. Yeah. Trapped definitely. in a house for the first time by myself, uh, singles, just like, Oh, it was, I was not doing very good. And it was a nice, nice way to go out and be there for the fans, give them a unique fan experience and also get me out of the house and out of my head during uh the quarantine times because you know there were so many people um suffering just from the isolation where we are definitely um we, we like to be part of a group you know yeah. we're, we're interactive with others and when you take that away whew, oh yeah it's it, tough it, it it's could be tough. not good <laughs> um did you when you would show up um i mean i, I imagine you know if you're talking about 14 17 so like a 31 bases in all mm-hmm. 31 of these trips yeah um i still have eight more left <laughs> <laughs> but every one of them, I imagine, imagine was a little bit different, right? Definitely. I didn't put it on uh, any of my social media because I definitely wanted each individual experience to be unique. And let that and let them post it themselves. Like if they exactly. would post and then you would do a repost or something. Yeah. Actually, I wouldn't even do any repost. Like, really? Yeah, they wanted okay. to post it. I'm going to post it all at the end. Yeah. But you know, I didn't want somebody to see something happen in that one and then yeah. have an expectation. Oh, yeah. that's what this thing is all about. Okay. No, I'm coming in there and blowing your mind with brand new stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm very much a person that can go with the, the water yeah. uh, down that stream, navigate new experiences, and kind of kind of read it from there. And it was great. Did you have any that like invited you in to have dinner and stuff? Oh yeah, I actually there was a <laughs> uh, a police officer up in 
Minnesota. I can't remember his name right now, but uh, it was taking me a while. Still taking me a while. Uh, <laughs> I was. I thought I was going to do all these bases at one time. Yeah. And uh, I did a run up the West Coast at first. I think I did like six or seven in a row, and I was like, I'm going to need to break this up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, it was taking me a little while, and I guess it was this uh, police officer's birthday that was coming up. And I don't know if I saw it in my comments or if I saw it on another comment thread somewhere, but I immediately messaged Liad, my assistant. I was like, Liad, get in touch with his, uh, with his wife. I want, I want to meet them. I knew they were going to Chicago to celebrate his birthday. Yeah. So <laughs> I told Liad, schedule a, um, a dinner with those guys. I'm going to bring the base to Chicago, give it to him for his birthday. And uh, I forget the name. What's the name of the burger joint in Chicago? It's like a heavy metal burger spot. Oh God. I don't know. <laughs> it's not coming to me right now. I, I can think of the, cause I got a shirt, Yeah, but it's a heavy metal burger spot in, okay. uh, in Chicago. And <laughs> I had my camera. I was like, yeah, get ready to walk in. We're going to go do this base package over here. He doesn't know I'm coming. So I'm excited to see how excited he's going to be. So then I walked in and because he's a cop, very stoic. He's like, Oh, Hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I was like, that's the reaction. I'm not using this. <laughs> yeah, I was all full of myself. I was like, "Oh, I'm walking in there, changing this dude's life." Yeah, yeah. He's like, he's like, "What are you doing here?" <laughs> well, it's probably. I'm sure after he was probably, you know, he was. They probably- actually got a real good experience because I forgot my sharpie at the okay. hotel that I needed to sign their base, and yeah. I've been working on like just ideas and and demo and stuff for, uh, you know to get me through the pandemic. I was writing sure. a bunch of new songs and whatnot. And I was like, Hey, uh, you guys want to go back to the hotel and meet me there so I can get my Sharpie and let you hear some of these songs. So, oh, nice. Yeah. It was like 10 30 at night. I think when we got back to the hotel and I think I had like seven songs or so. So I was giving them a little preview and apparently I had it turned up too loud at uh, 10 30 at night in the hotel. Cause I got a, a call from security. Hey, uh, we're getting some reports. Are, are you hearing any loud music up there? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, it's me. I'm up here sharing some demo ideas with some friends. So they literally, like I said, I wanted each experience to be unique. And that was one of the uh, incredibly That's- unique ones. Bringing them back to the hotel because the bass player forgot his damn Sharpie. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that's incredible. I think that's great. And I think that... Um- Knowing where your head is at, because I think mm-hmm. a lot of the time my head might be at the same place you're at. <laughs> yep, you mean bald? Yeah, that yep. too. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I I totally understand um, the two sides of that, where you're giving someone a great experience, but you're getting a lot out of that as well. Um, Very much so. Like we like we talk about and what we do, yeah. being of service. That was a yeah. way for me to be of service to the fans and and give them something to look forward to, and uh, and yeah. But in doing the service. It also in turn helped me as well. Yeah. So, so th- that's a great segue into, into, um, you know, let's talk about what you and I have in common. You and I are both sober guys. Um, yes, sir. So you've been sober how long now? Uh, first got sober February 3rd, 2018. So, um, were it not for a mishap, uh, during the pandemic, which I haven't spoken publicly, publicly about until today, um, mishap in, uh, over the pandemic. It would have been four years, but right now I think I, I have to go back and look at the date. Honestly, I remember I went to a concert and I was trying to do, I was like, all right, I fell off the wagon. I've yeah. been back on the wagon. I'm going in. I'm going to try to control drinking this time. Yeah. I'm going to allow myself to have two. And if I do two, cool. Yeah. Nope. Did three. Haven't had a drink since. I was, I, I was like, I can't do it. Even yeah. trying to limit myself to two. I couldn't do that. <laughs> right. So that was your big mishap. That's not that bad. No, no, it was much worse before that. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, August of 2020, uh, post breakup, post being yeah. in the house by myself, uh, just it was not good. So yeah. uh, as I, I turned to not wanting to feel for a little while and uh, yeah, now back to it again, doing my meetings, doing all the uh, all the stuff, working with my sponsor, working the steps and all that stuff now. Yeah. So you and I are both part of a, of, of a 12 step program. Um, we're mm-hmm. both open about it. We, you know, we discussed this before I, we came on. So just oh, to yeah. make sure, you know, cause the last thing you want to do if you are part of a anonymous program is talk about things that are supposed to remain anonymous. But yeah. I think um, at least in my experience, it's so important for people that do have any kind of a platform to be vocal about it. And, to be, so. and, and, and I think sometimes, you know, the whole basis of, 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 a 12 step program is at the end of it, you're, you're passing on what you've learned to another person. So for you to kind of keep all of this information 
to yourself would almost be, it just, it, it's counterproductive. I tell you the moment that I decided I was going to share my story. When I went into rehab, uh, February 3rd of 2018, I went in, like, I didn't even tell the band I was going in. We were on like a four or five month break, I think in yeah. between, you know, going home in December and then going back out on the road in May. And I was fucking, it was, I was headed down. I was headed towards death, spiraling yeah. towards death at that point. I uh, decided to go into rehab. Didn't tell anybody. Uh, only people I told was um, my then wife, my parents, and um, whew, started talking about my parents. Got all uh, felt it there for a second. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then my buddy Greg, he's the one that drove me to rehab. Um, he'd been sober for like twenty years, and he was a guy that I called uh, that that morning when I was just I'd, I'd gone for it the, the night before, and then woke up feeling like all right, this is this is not going to go well. Yeah. So I was in rehab here in Vegas and there was an old black dude. He um, was like a garbage collector from New York. And he was talking about all of the dangerous places that he'd gone to uh, get. I think it was his was crack. Right. Um, all the all the dangerous places that he'd gone to get crack cocaine. And I had forgotten about going to a favela in Brazil when we were there to get blow. Wow. wow. And I'm identifying with this guy who I've got nothing in common with. Yeah. Black dude from New York, trash collector, never, never met him before in my life, but I was inspired by his story. Yeah. I'm like, if I'm able to connect with this guy, given the platform that I have, why am I keeping this to myself Yeah. when I could be, I could help so many other people. I know they, uh, in the program, they always talk about, um, uh, what is it? Something over attraction, uh, uh, um, attraction rather than promotion. Yes. Traction yeah. rather uh, than promotion. But it's a unique situation. I don't really, I don't wave that particular flag, but I'm aware. I make people aware that I am sober. I am working the 12 steps, yeah. um, you know, to, to be given everything. My dream had finally come true. When I first saw Gene Simmons at the age of four, and I was like, whatever he's doing, that's what I want to do. Yeah. At 40, what was it? 40, 43, I think when I, when I got sober. At the age of 43, I was living my dream. And that still wasn't enough for me. Right. Uh, another good friend in one of our, in one of the rooms that you and I both know uh, brought it up one time. He's like, how is it that every single person in this room has attained their dream? We're out here doing it. And every single person in this room has done everything in their power to fuck that up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it, and, and it's classic. I mean, it's all, it's self-sabotage and completely. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing that alcoholics and addicts do. And, and, you know, I, I really believe that people like us are, were built a little different. You know, we're not like everybody else. Uh, we can't, you know, just that your, your, your example of, you know, I'm going to have two drinks and you, you couldn't, you had to have three. Yeah. I I'm like that with everything in my life. So Same here. <laughs> just because I took alcohol out of my life and out of the equation and it's been out of the equation for 29 years. Right. Congratulations. By the way. Thank you. I, I still have all the isms of my alcoholism. Oh, like, yeah. you know, you look behind me, like I, I just, I, I do everything in excess, but yeah. I don't do things in excess necessarily are going to kill me. Yes, so, exactly. So I think it's just finding a balance and, and that's that, you know, that goes back to your base experiences and stuff. There's a nice balance that happens when you do something like that. There's an ebb and flow of energy, you know, mm -hmm. you're giving, you're getting back and, um, and it's humility, you know, it, 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 in a way it's humility because you're putting yourself out there. And as much as, you know, you're talking about when you go into the restaurant and you're waiting for the big reaction, the guy's like, and you're like, and, and but that, but that's, those are those little shots of humility that we get. And, and we, and, and they teach us along the way, no matter what, we're always being taught along the way. And with this platform, there's a certain level of accountability as well. A hundred percent. If I'm vocal about it, yeah. this happened to me. I tried to get sober um, a couple of years before I actually went into rehab. I was just trying to do it on my own. And I've been vocal about, yep, I gave it up. I did this. I did an interview with Dean Del Rey and I was talking about it. And yeah. uh, shortly thereafter, I was out on the road caught a case of the fuckets with whatever I was going through at that point, uh, over dramatizing everything. Cause that's what I like to do back in the day. Now I'm much more centered, much more focused, a lot of stoicism in here today. <laughs> um, but I had, I had just poured a drink and I was walking off the bus and a fan came running up to me. Kale, I want to thank you for like you going sober made me think about myself going sober. And there I am standing with the fucking, uh, makers of ginger ale yeah. in my hand. I'm like, Oh, yeah, man, you know, just doing what I can, doing what I can to help out. Yeah. And I felt like such garbage. So it, it was important for me, for my own accountability to be yeah. vocal about it. Um, Cause you know, 
we're, I don't know about you, but I'm a people pleaser. Or I was. Same, same. Yeah. People yeah. pleaser. I want to make people happy. I don't want people to uh, be disappointed in me. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, it was very important for me to be vocal about it so that others would know. And I kind of have that babysitter collectively around the world watching. Um, yeah. I'm much better at uh, self accountability and um, not needing other people to, to have their eye on me. I'm, I'm, I think I'm out of that out from under that rock at this point, but, you know, collectively, you know, we do the groups, we do our meetings, all kinds of stuff. So uh, I, I, I still have that support system, even tighter support system. My God, um, the pandemic, I did more meetings in zoom yeah. than I ever did same. before the pandemic. Same, so same. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was obviously COVID was awful, but you know, if, uh, if you look for the silver lining to things, uh, you can turn a negative into a positive if you yeah. just, you know, clear your mind, look around, take a uh, full scope of, of what's going on and just uh, really, you know, continue to do the right thing. Um, now you're, you're, you know, I think we've got the worst of that behind us in terms of pandemic. It looks like we're, you know, you're in Vegas, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Canada. So we're getting there now, you know, we're starting to get there, but we're taking it a little bit slower, but I know in Vegas, you guys have been pretty open for a while now. Um, yep. And it looks like this thing is moving forward in terms of, uh, you know, getting out of that and getting back to what we normally like to do. Um, I see a lot of tour dates on the books for you. Are you, are you excited about that? Is there any point, do you have any apprehension after being off for so long <laughs> or is it just more like, yeah. let's go? No, if I'm being honest, there, there's a little bit of apprehension. Sure. Honestly, I've gotten used to being alone. Yeah. Um, even like I've, I've canceled going to a couple of different concerts here in town. Cause I'm just like, oh, do I want to go all the way down to the strip? Yeah. Park, walk in. It's just like, oh, I'm like, yeah. Luckily the, the pandemic has blessed me with a uh, certain ability to be alone and be okay with that. Now I sure did not have that before uh, the pandemic. I was, you know, very much a people person, always going out, always doing stuff. But now I can sit here alone in this house, alone with my thoughts. And that's cool. And I really like that a lot. Yeah. Um, and even when we first started announcing the dates coming back, I was like, I don't know, I might need to reevaluate this. Like I'm, I had like some nerves sure. about it. You know, anytime you go, you're getting ready to have change, you get anxiety about that change. Yeah. Uh, I did not want to be alone in the house. I hated that. Once I got used to being alone in the house, you loved it. I didn't want to go back outside again. Yeah. Typical addict shit. I can't sure. ever be, uh, I can't ever be happy with what I got. Yeah. <laughs> again, much better about it today but it still comes up every now and then. So uh, there was a little apprehension. And then um, the UFC had their first fights in a full arena on TV. Yeah, yeah. And I was watching it and out of the blue, it hit me. I heard that crowd and I was like, okay, now I'm ready. I'm getting goosebumps yeah. thinking about it. Now, yeah. now I'm ready to get back out there. So um, I'm going to definitely have to take time for myself while I'm out there, find those little pockets of, of me time. Yeah. Um, Cause when you're out there on the road, you're given, you're given, you're given. Oh yeah. And you come home depleted sometimes. So I got to make, make, make sure I'm taking the steps to maintain that resilience reservoir and uh, able to allow the, the cup that usually runneth over, keep that cup as full as possible. So I can continue being there for people, but I'm definitely getting excited. Uh, you know, there's um, we did two shows last year. We did Blue Ridge rock festival and then the Iowa state state fair. Yeah. And just like, not even just for myself, but we talked about giving back and being of service to other people. So many people have been looking for us, waiting for us to be able to get back out there on the road, get them out of the house. So a lot of it is, is me right now anyway, is me going like, okay, you are, you're here for a reason. You have a purpose. You're able to get out there. And even if just for an hour and a half, add positively to whatever that person has going on in their life. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, right. Um, I love like the band situation with us right now. Everything's awesome. We just did a photo shoot this past, uh, this past weekend for uh, the new record that we're working on right now here in Vegas. Uh, a bunch of new press photos. We all hung out. Um, Charlie's in town right now. He lives up in Minnesota, but we got the entire gang here in Vegas right now. And yeah, just a, it's a good friendly vibe. And yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back out on the road with friends rather than, uh, you know, getting back out with the business as it has been yeah. at other times in uh, the, the life of this band. Good friendship, good circle. We all, like, uh, for the last tour that we were out on, we were all having um, post-show food 
in the same dressing room, which never happens. So wow. the relationships in there, are, we've built on those and things are good. So just a good vibe overall. And now we can get out there and, you know, with all the other stuff going on, which I don't even want to talk about because it's too much garbage going on there. And I'm an entertainer. I like yeah. to get out there and be part of the healing process. Of course. Um, but just to be able to get out there and be part of the healing process amongst all the turmoil that's happened over the last couple of years. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, tell me a bit. We, we briefly talked about it before we got on. Tell me a bit about um, the pop. You guys have a pop figure. Yes. The Funko. We have the knucklehead yeah. uh, that just came out. I want to say like last week or something like that. Uh, management. I still haven't got mine yet. So uh, do I have to you? You know my address. Stop fucking around. Give me the goddamn knucklehead. All right. <laughs> so, so when you got, when you get to do stuff like that, um, it, it, it must be fun. Oh yeah. I grew up listening to kiss, you yeah. know, kiss dolls. I want five finger death punch action figures. That's yeah. like you know, one, one of the bucket list items was um, playing with Metallica. We're doing that in Europe. This coming up summer. We got three shows with those guys. I saw you're doing some, I saw you're doing some festivals with kiss as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. The first one back uh, May 19th. Yeah. I welcome to Rockville here in town. Uh, yeah, we've, we've def we played a couple of shows with kiss. So um, have you got, have you gotten to meet, have you gotten to meet Gene? I have, I have uh, Jason hook. Uh, our old guitarist used to play with Eric Singer and Alex okay. Cooper. Yep. So uh, Eric got us to beat the band, got to hang out and talk to him and whatnot. Yeah. And those dudes walking around in those boots. I mean, I'm six one. I think they're all probably at least six one. And then they put those boots on and, and I'm standing next to them. I'm like, so this is how everybody else feels. All right. <laughs> so you must've turned into a little kid when you met Gene. Oh, completely. Yeah. yeah. I'm always a little kid when it comes to rock and roll. Uh, yeah. Definitely a fanboy. Uh, I listen to music pretty much all day long. I used to, Jeremy used to get on me so much called the, the death metal front lounge. I would wake up in the morning, bring out my Bluetooth speaker, automatically start playing carcass, obituary, <laughs> mid index, all kinds of stuff. And he's like, my God, you start the day like this? <laughs> yeah, I used to. Now, yeah. now I give myself an hour of silence, no phone, no nothing, just to kind of you know, yeah. come in a place of gratitude rather than immediately starting off with the chaos. But uh, yeah, always a fanboy. I've got. Uh, well, I see some stuff. I see some. I see a figure behind you underneath. Yeah, that a fan actually. That's me. Oh, nice. A fan made a figurine of me. Um, I got like the tree of life right there that I got as a gift yeah. when I first got sober. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I got the the ego wall. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right there. <laughs> uh, another fan made this figurine over here. It's the Kel Tulu uh, with the the wings and whatnot. So yeah. Um, Try not to put a whole lot of stuff of myself because it's like, I don't be yeah. a jackass, you know. <laughs> but there, there's a, a certain couple of small pieces that uh, that mean a lot and were very cool and, and come with a story. When a fan takes the time to do something like that for you, that's pretty oh, nice. You know? We've had so many cool things happen to us from the from the fan perspective. I mean, bringing us gifts like that, um, drawings. I've got. Uh, there's a couple of people that have. Uh, my Cal Army logo they, that I yeah I see somebody yeah, else <laughs> yeah, I've seen those on the hats those are those are rad oh thank you thank you um and like uh, people have tattooed my face on yeah. there and all that stuff it's just like my face is on somebody's inside of their arm it's it's crazy but then yeah. again I got Gene Simmons tattooed on my shin so <laughs> I get it <laughs> we we are the same people we're right. the same yeah, yeah yeah no no I get it I get it I may have a really cool job end of the day we both love rock and roll still nerds. <laughs> Um, so lastly, before, before I let you go, um, I, we, we did a project together called the Kings of quarantine, oh, yeah. um, which was to help out out of work roadies. And, uh, and it was put, you know, one of the guys that got me in touch with you, uh, was your tour manager at the time. Um, okay. and I, I remember immediately was like, no problem. It was, it wasn't even a hesitation. It was mm. like, yep, no problem. And yeah. that was a fun project because it really showed people, um, that there are, you know, things can still happen from a distance. And I think it changed, I think the pandemic, if anything, changed a lot of, a lot of people's perceptions on what needs to be, you know, what, what the situation needs to be for positive things to happen. Like some people think, well, you need to be in a room together. You need to be in the same city. Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were talking briefly about, you know, um, doing 12 step meetings from afar with different oh, yeah. people, but collaborating too. I mean, you know, we, we've heard these, you know, people have been doing this for years, swapping files back and forth, but to be able to put together projects like that, and you saw tons of people doing these quarantine covers mm -hmm. from a distance, it was a really fun snapshot of a moment, which I think in, in, you know, 10 years from now, you'll be able to look back and go, oh yeah, I remember when that happened. Did you enjoy that process? 
It was great. I had a lot of fun. Uh, just Another Victim was one of my favorite songs. I was in college radio when that record came out. Yeah. And uh, just, okay, you know, the Helmet and House of Pain together. Just, yeah. It was so crazy. Good. So good. Yeah. Such a good, strong groove, you know? Um, and so when I heard that you guys were doing that, I was like, yep, sign me up. Let's get it done. Um, I did another cover of um, uh, Shortest Straw by Metallica. Oh, with, yeah. Uh, Doc Coyle, um, a bunch of other dudes, Chris from Byzantine, yeah. Mike Portnoy. Yeah, um, full demo from uh, Machine Head back then, and yeah, it was just a lot of fun getting up there. And you know, that was the first time the bass had been heard on Short of Straw. So yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, exactly. Oh yeah, I'm doing that song for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it was fun doing that. And like you said, you know, you can't stop living. Yeah. There's different variations, and like everything is temporary. The yeah. good, the bad, everything is temporary. Everything is fluid. To be happy, you got to release the reins and quit, try, quit trying to control stuff and just go with it regardless yeah. of what it is. If you're going through a bad time, there's going to be something that you're going to learn from that thing. Yeah. Just let it happen. And I learned in the, uh, the pandemic, number one, I can be alone, which I never thought of yeah. ever before that. Uh, I can, um, I can create my own schedules. I don't have to have a job, have to have a gig to do stuff. Uh, <laughs> that sounds uh, very much like a success problem. It is. I admit <laughs> Uh, but you know, I had to, I had to figure it out myself rather than waking up and going to a day sheet and be like, okay, this is all spelled out for me all day yeah. long. I can't sit in here and just rot. I had to do things. And you know, there's, and again, just finding, being able to find the positives and collectively what could have been a huge negative, but I've seen so much birth, so much growth, not only personally, but in those around me as well. Yeah. Definitely some, uh, some struggles along the way, personally, collectively yeah. for everybody. But, you know, at the end of the day, anybody watching this, we are all still here. Yeah. You always have a chance to turn it around. If you're going through something right now that's bothering you right now, hit the reset button. doesn't matter what you've done in the past. You can't do anything about it in the, of the future other than be present, be in the moment, be in the now. And then if you're doing everything right today, it's going to work out for you in the future as well. Good words to live by, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. I really appreciate it and uh, continued success. And, and I'm looking forward to finally meeting you in the flesh. I hope that yes. can happen soon. Getting back out on the road. What city in Canada are you up in? Montreal. Montreal. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Uh, I, I don't know that we're coming up there just yet, but I have seen, uh, I heard about dates when I was hanging out with, uh, with Zoltan and the gang this past week. And uh, it's getting ready to get amped back up with touring and whatnot. So uh, regardless of whether this thing comes back, whatever, you know, we're, we're being in the moment and doing yep. what we can as we can. And uh, yeah, you were talking about, oh, it's the end of this. I'm not saying nothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I've been I, I, wrong. I've had, to, I've had to eat crow yeah. and be disappointed. Today, yeah. I have no expectations of anything. That's the best way uh, to be. Yeah. And it's, it is working for me right now. Uh, all things considered. Uh, so much real chaos and, and whatnot going on out there, but I'm unattached to any of it. I'm just living, doing me, and that seems to be working for me today. Thanks for taking the time, man. Of course, Jason. Thank you very much. Dude, I like it when you get in these chats with people. Like, I've seen you do long interviews. I've seen you do short interviews. But these are, you know, when you connect with your guests, I really, I like those ones. Because those are my favorite podcasts. When people are just shooting the shit. Yeah. Or the conversation is organic. And ever since uh, the mighty bass master of Anthrax was on the show, I think that Ron English and this one are not only our longest chats. Actually, no, kudos to the director of National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. He gave us an hour, too. That, that was a long one. That was a long one. That yeah, was one of my favorites, yeah. too. But this is right up there. I really like the the chemistry you guys had. And it's interesting how the internet allowed you to technically work together so many, uh, a few times yeah. before even actually meeting. I mean, yeah. you still haven't met him. So. No, no. And it's funny, these internet... Well, met him. Yeah, no, we haven't met face to face. And th and that's the beautiful thing about the internet and about the positive side of it is that there's connections that can happen. And uh, and you can you can form bonds with people without even meeting them face to face. So when you do finally meet someone face to face, it's fun. Uh, like the other day, I met Derek Green, who was our, our previous guest. I went to, uh, I couldn't go to the Sepultura show in Montreal because I was working, but I went after and we met outside the venue and we chatted for like 20 minutes. And it was just so good to like, you know, 
shake his hand, give him a hug and be, and, and, and like cement that relationship. So uh, I'm looking forward to doing that with Chris because he, we, we have, we had a nice connection and he was just, he's just a rad, rad dude. And, and I'm really, really happy. He, uh, he agreed to be on man right before we go. I, you know, it's kind of weird. Like I work, uh, we work on the show yep. and we edit things together. And as soon as the guest comes in, you know, there's a lot of editing involved and there's not a lot of absorption of what you and the guests are talking about. I finally got to see Studio 666 at two o'clock in the morning last yeah, night. Yeah. Did you like it? And I love Dave Grohl's hammy performance. Like I got exactly, he was playing like a Scooby-Doo character in a horror movie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. I, I, I totally got what he was doing and almost the 1970s, like possession uh, ghost story a aspect of it all. I really got where they where they were coming from, mixed with a little bit of eighty slasher. Yeah, and it's um and also I've been listening to a lot of uh, Candle yep. and Gold. Yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. I, and all these other guests we've had. Um, I finally saw Batman. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm rewatching our episodes, really absorbing all this stuff that I want to know now that I really enjoy all the content that you were talking about, you know, yeah. and what they were putting out and advertising. Yeah. It, it, it's been, you know, what I, what I like about the show is that we can pretty much have anybody on that has something interesting to talk about, or if they're interesting characters and, and I like, you know, not limiting it to maybe musicians and, and, and having other kinds of people on. Um, and that's why, you know, the, this, this, we want this to be a place where we just get to know interesting people. And, um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's been a fun, been a really, really fun ride so far. And I'm looking forward to doing this a lot more. So we've got some really cool guests on the way um, coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, I don't want to give anything away, but we've got some pre pretty heavy hitters coming uh, to the Rockman Power Hour. And we also want to remind you, please like and subscribe if you are enjoying what you're listening to. Uh, feel free to share it on social media. We're also going to be running uh, a lot of contests over on our Facebook page um, over the next few weeks. Um, so, you know, if you're into movies, we're doing some really cool uh, contesting with with paramount to um to give away some copies of some rad movies and thank you again for being here and being part of our journey uh ryan let me ask you before we leave let, let's give them a shout out one more time uh, heartbeat hot sauce i am loving this stuff they are a uh, wonderful wonderful partners and uh, please go check them out at heartbeathotsauce.com again i've been really really uh, vibing on this red habanero it's got a bite to it and um something great to put on your eggs in the morning you can put this on a burger if you're having a burger or a veggie burger or on a submarine sandwich whatever you like to usually use for hot sauce they've got one for you so check them out heartbeathotsauce.com a small batch fermenters out of thunder bay ontario that uh, we're really really happy to be associated with uh and i want to thank my co-host ryan stick thank you again for being uh with us today always doing uh, the heavy lifting i want to thank our producer julia kajerski and our guest chris kale and uh, again we will see you next week on the rockman power hour <music>